What's the what's the um, like top three typical mistakes that bands do when they like uh, have a have a booked studio time and they arrive here at the door? I've always played like that. Yeah, but it doesn't say that in Guitar Pro. <laughs> Sitting in the studio writing a guitar solo. It's like could be the most expensive guitar solo <laughs> ever made. Det är Alfred. Arthur. Alfred. Arthur. Ah. Oh, hey, Bob. <laughs> the knob that is not connected to anything you can just turn it a little bit and do is this better? And then I'm like reaching for it, but I haven't done it yet. And they say, oh, that sounds much better. And I'm like, I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> like the placebo effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the placebo effect is underestimated. Oh, hello. Uh, what was the original question? I don't remember what we were talking about. I have no idea. <laughs> I wanted my guitar to sound like a hammer, like smashing on a beef. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that a lot of modern metal albums even have uh, like MIDI bass guitar? I had no idea about that. So today we have Ulf Blomberg and uh, we are in his studio at uh, Hoborek right now. Yes. Merry Christmas, by the way. Merry Christmas and welcome. Ulf Blomberg, you uh, you run the studio Hoborek. Yes. You have um, Hobo uh, Hobofest. You are in the band Graceful Fall. Uh, you have been in M40. You have two brothers there as well. Yeah. Uh, you've been in Exhale and. You uh, you also host the uh, greatest midsummer parties at uh, you and uh, your girlfriend's cabin, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you play all the cool instruments, and you also have a YouTube channel, and you just reach ten thousand viewers. Yeah, exactly. Subscribers. Yeah, yeah, subscribers. Yeah. That's what it's called. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and of course, I know you as a friend from uh, for for many years. Yeah, it's, it's been, been quite a few years now. Yeah, I think ever since I moved to to Malmo. Yeah, we're in the south of Sweden in Malmo. Very very mm. south, and at the countryside. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's how I would describe you, more or less. Uh, how would you describe yourself? Mm, yeah, that's a pretty good description, I guess. Uh, the only thing that is maybe not really true is that I was never really in M40. I was a live bass player for them before they released the first album, but I was never a member. It was like a mixed mixed uh, duty of different people who took the bass at live. Uh, but the M40, that was also your brothers, right? Yeah, it's my brothers, my two younger brothers are uh, playing in M40. And I, I produced pretty much all their stuff. So we kind of grew up together as bands and producer. Yeah. And you also released the uh, M40 albums on Hoborek, right? Yes, I think I've been involved in releasing some EPs and stuff when I had when I had a label. I don't have the label anymore since a few years. How come that you stopped with the label? I stopped the label when I had to make Hoborek my full time, uh, what do you call it, full time living. So I had to cut the pieces that didn't make any money, <laughs> yeah. and I was a terrible. Uh, label uh, owner <laughs> <laughs> and it was only you at the label right mm -hmm. yeah. i put a lot of money in pressing the the vinyls and stuff and then i was really bad at doing the pr work so <laughs> it was <laughs> nothing really happened i see i see not my strong suit but you also ran it as a distro right? yeah it was actually when we were touring a lot with graceful fall I, it felt like a good idea to have it as a distro, and then I took, brought a distro with me on the tours. Yeah. And then it worked out pretty good. But since a few years, we are not touring that much. So I tried to make it a little bit on uh, post order online. But also, the same thing there, I'm terrible at, uh, <laughs> at keeping up with posts, uh, like shipping out orders and stuff like that. I'm really bad at that. So, yeah, that's also a reason why I quit. Yeah. I see. 
um your uh, your youtube channel uh, t- uh, tell the viewers a little bit about that um i started it because i wanted to like give back to the internet community a little bit because i learned so much about recording and stuff through internet and i just i like to watch youtube clips a lot so i thought i can do this um and just started doing at first i did it every second week uh did a video about like mostly tips and tricks about recording and mixing um and i released them together with a swedish uh, magazine called studio.se uh, which is also really good because then i have i have to do it every second week and deliver it to them because if i didn't have the accountability of delivering it to them i also would probably not do it <laughs> I'm <Yeah. really laughs> discipline i'm kind of flaky <laughs> with some in some regards when i when i don't have uh, anyone expecting me delivery then i just i'm the worst procrastinator yeah i see um do you feel do you feel like that in some sense uh when it comes to recording as well that you maybe book in a, a little bit more uh, work than you uh, maybe have the time to do just to be able to produce mm, not r- maybe not not that i book more than i can handle but i probably don't plan out too much about the mixing phase i book my calendar on with the recording and then i mix when i have time in between and sometimes that can be a bit fully booked and then it can be a bit slow um but usually it turns out yeah usually it's okay and also then then i have someone is paying me and someone expects results so i usually deliver but i mean i do sometimes i uh, uh, procrastinate a little bit there too but it's not not really procrastination it's more i think i have more time than i actually have I'm not sure if you recognize that problem. <laughs> I'm a time, uh, time optimist. For sure. <laughs> uh, Ready in the last minute mm-hmm. and uh, always uh, take on too much work. Yeah. Uh, the name Hoborek. Uh, <laughs> how come? Uh, I started the studio with, together with a guitar player from uh, Graceful Fall. And we're just we're playing around with different words. Uh, and it was a lot of... For some reason, a lot of the first words had something to do with Russia or Soviet. So we had a Pravda production. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and Kalashnikov creation <laughs> and stuff like that. But we didn't, uh, we couldn't get it approved by the, the what do you call it, the, the company registration. Oh, we yeah. registered the name for actually having a legit uh, business. Oh, shit. Uh, so we just tried different stuff. And then he came up with hobo, and he said that meant aggression in Russian. But I'm not actually sure that's true because I haven't found any anything to uh, confirm that. But I mean, the English word for hobo is pretty uh, accurate too, since we started out at like doing real basic DIY recordings and stuff like that. So I thought it was cool and. Uh, if you spell it like you do now, but read it with the Cyrillic in Russian, then it means novel, which is new. Okay. So it's, yeah, <laughs> keeping keeping up with time and uh, at the same time being a DIY hobo. So <laughs> a, uh, a novel, uh, novel yeah. Uh, hobo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what should we call you? What What's your profession? Is it like a sound uh, t- sound technician, uh, producer? Yeah, I would say uh, recording and mixing engineer mostly. I sometimes take on kind of pro- the production hat too, but I wouldn't call myself a producer uh, because I usually let the bands do their thing. And if I if I if I have any ideas and stuff, I usually tell them. But it's not like I get really involved with songwriting and stuff like that. I try to keep out of that. I, usually the bands are better at presenting their ideas and what they want to do. And I'm just there to help them to translate that <laughs> to actually being a record. Yeah. 
do you sometimes feel it's uh, like uh, like annoying in some way that uh, somebody aren't able to perform um, uh, like damn it, I could have done that better? Sometimes, but not really. I usually feel bad for like instru- people playing the instruments if they have an idea, something they they have written that they want to perform, but they can't really do it. So I can see how frustrated they get. And I try to help them come up with different ideas how to solve it. Um, but I'm not really an elitist when it comes to that. I know other producers that like just grab the instrument and play it for them. But I think that's... Uh, if I if I were in a band and I was in a studio trying to make a record, I would not appreciate someone doing that. <laughs> so... I don't I don't really agree with that way of working. I think it's better to keep the what do you call it? Uh, just keep a good vibe and try to make everyone happy and perform as good as they can. And you always have the the magic in the computer to help. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, when when uh, when did you start with uh, uh, this? Uh, uh, when did you start your business, like from the beginning? Oh. Yeah, we started two thousand and four, and then we were just having like a few microphones and recording out of our rehearsal space. We actually started it because we were releasing the first uh, EP with Grace Would Fall, so we started it as a studio and a record label, uh, and then we thought we can just bring our services, helping other bands in, uh, we were in Jönköping then, which is a bit north from where we are now. Um, so we thought we have some recording equipment, we can help other bands record for really cheap, instead of going into really expensive studios that they aren't really, that they aren't really ready for. Yeah. So, yeah, it was kind of slow for me coming from that to like now making a living from it to actually to find a sweet spot where you charge enough to make a living but not too much because you want to be kind of keep the same ideal still (laughs) but yeah keep it it's hard yeah it's hard to be an idealist and still eat (laughs) especially if if you want to renovate a house yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) that's what you do right now Yeah, yeah yeah you just moved into a house and and renovate but the diy skills come come in good hand it comes in handy yeah, yeah. there was some uh, water leakage uh, underneath the floor mm-hmm. you told me yep <laughs> <laughs> diy <laughs> stay alive yeah <laughs> uh i have a spanish friend and uh, uh he uh, he sent me some questions two questions actually oh, really? uh, his name is Luis and mm-hmm. has a dog called bingo bingo <laughs> Oh, hello. You don't know me, and you don't know this dog, but but you you do now. His name is Bingo, and he's really funny. My name is Luis. Um, <laughs> ew. <laughs> I live in Spain, and uh, I have two questions for you, because uh, my questions are pretty cool questions, and Ellis likes my questions. Therefore, uh, first question is, who's the worst drummer you've ever recorded <laughs> who would like like engineering wise like like a drummer that had to take like 70,000 takes and you're like oh my god dude who is that drummer and uh, or if you don't want to share his name which i really think you should is um or tell us at least the experience recording that drummer uh, hmm. you don't need to name names yeah. but he wants a name he wants a name, <laughs> but I don't have to name names. <laughs> I actually don't remember the name, but it was a, a drummer who booked in this studio uh, to record drums from an album, and then they were recording the rest of the stuff themselves with guitars and vocals and stuff. I think he was here for like six or seven days recording ten songs on drums. So... Yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, first I I thought you were gonna say uh, my friend Jens. Who is that? Uh, the, the black metal drummer. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the only reason that took time was, was because the song was so long. <laughs> yeah, like 19 minutes, something mm -hmm. like that. Too long. Another story. <laughs> and my other question is, what's the best Swedish dessert ever? And uh, where does one pick it up when in Sweden? Thank you very much. This is Bingo. He's very funny. Then probably like strawberries and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. T typical Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just strawberries and milk. <laughs> That's typical Swedish. I don't know. What dessert do you like? Uh, sorry, what? What kind of desserts do you like? I'm not really. I'm not really that. Are like uh, Snickers cake. Yeah. With uh, whipped cream. Is that typical Swedish? No, it isn't typical Swedish. I don't know if you can have something that's very typical Swedish, made by in made in a vegan way. I'm not sure either. What um, is a typical Swedish dessert? I guess what you said, it's like milk with strawberries and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or blueberries with milk and sugar. There we go. Morotskaka, carrot cake. Yeah, okay, that's nice. Yeah. You, you can make that vegan. Yeah, good shit. Enough about sweet stuff. Let's go to the salty oh, questions. Clad cake. <laughs> Uh, the most typical bands that uh, that you uh, that you produce record, yeah. um, uh, it's uh, it's more of the extreme side, right? Yeah, I would say like, yeah, hardcore, hardcore punk, and like the punkier side of metal, where where punk and death metal meets, <laughs> sort of. Is that uh, is it because you feel most at home in that kind of music? Uh, yeah, things I like. I like the the sonics of it. To be honest, I'm not necessarily always loving that kind of music the most all the time. There are certain bands and certain songs that I really, really enjoy, but I don't listen to it that much. But maybe that's because I work with it all days. <laughs> um, but I really like the sounds, especially from like those really uh, saturated uh, crust records. Like the the HM2 stuff, <laughs> yeah. When it feels like you're just mushing stuff down your ears, and the drums are really like big and banging. Is that something typical uh, that you see at Tobruk? That the uh, HM2 classic Swedish pedal, mm, not Swedish sound, the not Swedish, Swedish sound. pedal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Japanese <laughs> Swedish sound. <laughs> and the fake ones from no, the second edition from Taiwan, I think. Yeah, yeah. I have the I have the Japanese one. I have them both. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear any difference. You don't? <laughs> no, I have. I haven't tried them side by side. Actually, you uh, you are the pro. I only know that uh, you should not use the electricity with them. You should just put in a battery because it always sounds better. Yeah, without... they do, and they sound really really weird if you have battery and uh, DC uh, the adapter. Tips and tricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, but as I said, yeah, the that kind of sound is what I like. And since I started working here, I've been really into like big drums with a lot of room because the rooms here are so big, so it's really easy to make them really slammy and big. Uh, yeah, this, I, uh, yeah, this is a huge place. Yeah, the recording room is. I think it's one hundred and thirty square meters. I'm not sure what that is in American. Big as fuck. Yeah, big as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's like five meters. I, I don't know. To the ceiling, yeah. Meter. Yeah, something like that. And uh, this room, uh, yeah. It's Seven, 70 square meters, this control room. So it's yeah. probably the biggest control room I've ever been in, to be honest. <laughs> And you also have sleeping uh, sleeping arrangements for for bands. Yeah, we have kitchen and a dining room, and upstairs there is we have two bedrooms with six beds and showers and stuff like that. Mm. So you can really come here and just just be here and concentrate on making the best possible record, yeah. which I think is really beneficial. And this is like far away from 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 the biggest city. It's like uh, you you can't walk to the city no. from here. So you can't walk to a store or have any distraction that way. This is like the countryside. Yeah, but the trains and buses go really close. So if you don't have a car and you have to get here, it's it's easy. 
but yeah i think i most bands really enjoy coming here and just be here and not being distracted by other stuff because the other studio i had before in young shopping was a lot smaller and then uh, people had to sleep at friends houses or at uh, like hostels and stuff like that and then you always have the issue of like yeah now the day is finished and we have to go home and then from wherever they wake up have to prepare and come back to the studio here if someone wakes up and three other guys want to sleep in it's fine they can sleep in and <laughs> whoever is ready in the morning can start yeah yeah that, that's uh that's great i i uh, visited the studio you had in john shopping once you did yeah uh, we actually met uh, at in john shopping and we uh, had some beers at my mother's place in john shopping true yeah around christmas time i think it was three yeah you were four there, years yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. Four. that's true yeah that was nice yeah it was like a, yeah yeah it was uh, it was, it was nice uh, having some christmas beers with your mom yeah <laughs> and she really enjoyed meeting the young folks yeah <laughs> I uh, I cut you off earlier about uh, the typical music and yeah. uh, how it uh, reflected your own uh, taste in music. Uh, it it reflects the kind of music I I play myself and that I kind of grew up with, sort of say. When I became a teenager, started listening to a lot of metal, fell out of that a little bit, and then came back into the punk part. I think I got sick of metal when everything started to sound the same in the late 90s early 2000 and uh, started listening to a lot of swedish pop music and then i fell back into punk and crust punk through uh, uh, sheet system yeah and then just fell in that rabbit hole <laughs> yeah. so Grå svarta tankar. yeah yeah great stuff uh, yes I think uh, they have meant a lot for uh, for uh, for like the whole European uh, cross scene. Yeah, uh, I guess. But to come back a little bit to it, I I do record other kind of music too. I uh, record some blues bands, uh, like country music and stuff like that, which I really enjoy as uh, to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. But I would say like eighty five ninety percent is like alternative extreme music, mm-hmm. and yeah. And you had um, uh, I Shoes Knife. Uh, yeah. I guess you could call it like pop, punk, rock. Yeah, it's, it's a weird mix of American and British pop punk, <laughs> Yeah, I would say. <laughs> With the roots and the clash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a mix of clash and Green Day. <laughs> Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. And uh, with the drummer of uh, Blink-182. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's weird, <laughs> but cool. Yeah. Uh, the Holbrook albums. I know uh, you have produced uh, Crimson Moonlight. Yeah. I'm just gonna name drop a few here, like uh, End of All, yeah. Crawl. Yes. I really, really dig Crawl. Um, yeah, me too. Uh, Trophies, Deadbeat Hero, Dead Sleep, uh, Symbios. Yeah, from Portugal. Uh, what would you say makes you unique in the line of work that you do? Like, uh, what's your trademark? This is gonna sound really, what do you call it, bisnerdit. <laughs> but I think... Uh, uh, shitty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretentious. No, but I, uh, I think my trademark is trying to find the band's sound. I know a lot of mix engineers and stuff like that that makes every band sound like not sound the same is it's a bit harsh to say but they like may try to make everything sound in the same line so it, you can hear who produced it and maybe i have I mean, of course i put my taste into it so maybe but i i'm not how am i going to explain this so I know some mix engineers they have like presets and stuff that they always use and try to make everything sound the same they have the same presets for guitar sounds like samples on drums and then everything sounds very streamlined but i try to try to take what's there from the beginning and i I really try to capture the sounds that the bands have and i really encourage bands to bring their own instruments and drums and amps 
because I think that's their sound and that's what it, they are going to use when they play live. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, that can be like counterproductive when it comes to recording an album because maybe it doesn't sound 100% as good as it could have sounded, but it's their sound. <laughs> I mean, if you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for mm. uh, 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 for sure. I mean, uh, when a band pick a studio, many times they look at, uh, of, of course, what uh, uh, where their uh, like favorite albums or yeah. their inspirations, uh, where they have recorded the album. So maybe they want that, want that preset. Yeah. Especially, I think like drums is, uh, I think it's pretty classic. Mm. Exactly like we have the HM2, so yeah. it's very easy to like easy to create the sound of course another thing to to record it yeah but, uh, uh, but i mean uh, like the presets on drums that uh, the, uh, that you talked about mm. uh, i don't know if it's uh, like the i have no idea uh, if, if it's like the triggers or what it is uh, yeah usually a lot of triggers these days did you know that a lot of modern metal albums even have uh, like midi bass guitar i had no idea about that it's like it's so now it's programmed drums and programmed bass guitar. So you only have like the guitar and vocals now. Oh. <laughs> All bands should have like bands so like uh, what, what so, is, soulless. so what, what is metal now? <laughs> yeah. I, thought, so, I, thought, so I thought metal was supposed to be some sort of punk music, but now it's like more <laughs> like produced like dance music. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, to each their own, I guess. <laughs> Open the door, motherfucker! I'm gonna kill you. Commercial time, motherfucker! Well, I started a Patreon. Wheel must is now on Patreon. It's Wheel must on Patreon. Well, if you want to help Wheel must on Patreon to grow bigger, stronger. Uh, and also have this awesome fucking cool shirts. Well, go on to Patreon. We must. You will also get uh, some extra material that I want to release on YouTube. And uh, you are also able to send me video questions uh, to upcoming guests, which you will know in beforehand which guest it will be. <laughs> on Patreon. We must. Just look at that shirt. Yeah. Imagine yourself in that one. Awesome. Well, back to the hardest part in your line of work. What would that be? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Would it be like uh, chemistry with other persons or would it be like people who want it one way and you can figure out what they are saying? I th yeah, I think the, the hardest part is to try try to figure out what they actually want because a lot of the time bands say they want something and when you deliver exactly that they all of a sudden want something else <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> like one example of that is I had a band here and they really 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 wanted to sound like Queller Talk yeah so we like uh, dialed in the guitar sound and everything it was like pretty straight on then I deliver, deliver the first mix, and then I say, no, 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 we want to sound like uh, Turbo Negro. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> but that's kind of totally different guitar sound to begin with, so it's going to be hard to, <laughs> to redirect that, but I think they were pretty happy in the, in the end of it, but it's hard to, to know what people actually want. Well, uh, what, uh, what would you guess? I mean... Uh, if I can like figure out a band that sounds like uh, like what I want, if I say like uh, I want my guitar to sound like a hammer, like smashing on a beef. <laughs> <laughs> what if if you would say that, I would ask you for some uh, references, I guess. But yeah. Do you, do you know any other bands that have this kind of guitar sound that you want, Elias? <laughs> 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 Could you tell me of any? <laughs> yeah. uh, like stroking a pissed off kitten. Yeah. <laughs> And that's also the hard part because people like communicating a feeling is really, really hard. Yeah. Like if you say, yeah, I want a <clears throat> guitar sound that sounds like smashing a hammer. That can mean one thing for you and a totally different thing for me. 
So that's also really hard. And so that's why I usually ask for references, which can be boring if you... My favorite situation is to work without references. If a band just comes in and are open to whatever it turns out to be, like you start working and you just say, okay, this sounds good, this sounds good, let's continue. And then you mix it from how you record it. Because the ideal situation when you mix something is to not do a lot of mixing. You, you have that done in the recording. Yeah. Uh, so just the sound takes you where it takes you, sort of, <laughs> like hippie shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's much more rewarding and more fun than working towards a strict reference point. If you come in and you give me a, like an At The Gates album and say, I want to sound exactly like this. No. It's pretty easy because then you know you just aim for that, but it's not that fun. Yeah, and uh, and that helps for bands when you like have more like free hands on like mm. creating the sound. Uh, I know that you have had many live recordings when the whole band is playing mm. playing at the same time. Is that something that you prefer? Depends on that. Depends on how finished the like the band's pre-production is if the songs are really like they know exactly what they're supposed to do yeah uh and the genre calls for it then i prefer that because i think it's it's really really cool to rig everything up and sit behind the the mix desk desk and just hear the band play instead of listening to drums for three days <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and then you're gonna hear the song <laughs> so i mean even if you play like a a rough guitar, a guide guitar to the drums, it's still hard to get the full feeling of the song. So yeah. It's nice to hear. And it's also much easier to to know if it's a good take because maybe the, the drums isn't perfectly played, but together, everyone together, it sounds great and it's a good feeling. Um, then I think you can get away with a lot of stuff if you're track live. So, like the optimal uh, solution for this is like for the da- for 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 the band itself to uh, to make like a shitty demo recording, even like with cell phones, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah like absolutely. in the rehearsal space, and send it to you. It's like this is what we sound like, but yeah. we want the production sound like this. Yeah, I really really like when bands send some sort of pre-recording for me to listen through the songs. It's much easier for me to, especially if we're going to start with just recording drums. Uh, it's then I can have that in the back of my mind, like knowing what it's supposed to sound like. Um, but to be honest, I always have a totally different feeling for the song when it's when it's finished and recorded than I had listening to the pre-production. Because it's one thing to hear a song. If you if you pre-record a song before you're going to come to the studio and say, yeah, this is a song, then I get one feeling of listening to it. But then when we work through the song from the beginning and start building it, I'm gonna get a totally different emotional connection to it, I guess. So I have a totally different feeling for a song when I when I when we're done with the re- recording than I have listening to it before the recording. That sounds weird, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I I I, uh, I, uh, I get it. Uh, what strikes what strikes me is um, it has to be so rewarding to like when you have the finished product like every time. Yeah. It's like it's like climbing a mountain every time, right? Yeah, ninety percent of the times it's like a like a rush when a re- when a re- record when a record is released, it's really a rush for most parts. If I'm if I'm happy with the <laughs> end result, uh, sometimes I'm not one hundred percent satisfied with the result, and then it's like, eh. but yeah, usually it's really really rewarding as you say what's the what's the um, like top three typical mistakes that bands do when they like uh, have a have a booked studio time and they arrive here at the door and uh... um not like the absolute most common mistake is not being fully prepared so they try to figure stuff out in the studio like having to write stuff and that's also a part with, with doing recordings, pre-productions, is to figure out stuff like that. Because a lot of the time, bands play something and they 
like all of a sudden it appears to them that they are not playing the same thing. Like they play stuff that contradicts each other. And it's, if there are two guitar players, the conversation is always, I've always played like that. And the other son, no, I have always played like this. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so, but how are we going to solve that now? <laughs> Yeah. I don't care what you always played. It's it, ha it has to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, what it's called the the software Guitar Pro. Yeah. I don't I don't think a lot of bands use that anymore. But like five ten years ago, it was lo lots of band wrote their songs in Guitar Pro. Yeah, exactly. And it was a really common and funny comment when someone played something wrong. And then the guitar player said, "I always played it like that." Yeah, but it doesn't say that in the Guitar Pro. <laughs> yeah. So Guitar Pro is the is the boss of the. <laughs> yeah, but that's perfect when you when you like program the riffs, yeah. and, and that's a very easy way to like figure out the harmonies if you don't have that. Yeah, really. Uh, if you don't have it by ear, like directly, and you can yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot of the music, of course, use uh, dissonances and yeah. not uh, nice harmonies in, in in that way. Mm. Like, uh, yeah. And uh, what the uh, what the second wh biggest mistake? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think it falls under the same because that's also like not having stuff finished. Yeah, that's probably the biggest. Second biggest is uh, not preparing your instruments. Uh, coming in with guitars that are not intonated uh, doesn't look like not working properly. Uh, <laughs> been there done that really <laughs> yeah there's a lot of people lots of people do that um uh, i've had to like take guitars apart and solder stuff here in the studio guitar like, technician <laughs> yeah i don't mind but i mean that comes off their studio time so it's mm. it's their mistake it's cheaper to do it in town yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's also like, yeah, going back to the first mistake and not being prepared. I mean, sitting in the studio writing a guitar solo, it's like, could be the most expensive guitar solo <laughs> ever made. Um, that's another good thing here, though. If you come here and record and stay here, uh, when I go home in the evening, you can still like listening to the stuff and practice and keep writing. Um, so that can be really productive if you if you're not already too tired. <laughs> no. um, third mistake: um, doing too many songs. I think. Like, uh, uh, what uh, what time do you prefer to like record an album? How many days is that for you? My ideal to record an album is between one and two weeks. Uh, less than a week is fully doable, but then I think it's a bit too rushed. You can't really go deep into it. Depends on what kind of music. Uh, bird flesh maybe don't need a week <laughs> to record an album. I don't know. <laughs> Last recording was I have candy in my mouth. Yeah, <laughs> I brought candy. Mm. Um, I think other <clears throat> recorded. 25 songs in uh, what was it five and a half hour mm -hmm. so uh, yeah that's um hung over pretty efficient yeah but uh, but that's re reflecting the music as well yeah. i guess it's crazy i think i think the problem is that a lot of bands they want to cram in as much as they want and in a short time because obviously they have a limited budget and I have full, what do you call it? I understand that fully, but you can't really cut the time short and then also cram in like how many songs, as, as many songs. Um, because, yeah, each song is going to lack attention if you try to do too much in too short of time. Yeah. And that's a pretty common mistake, actually. It's like always the last day. Oh, we have this left. We have this left. Oh, we have just skipped that. Maybe we can. I mean, sometimes bands keep recording stuff after or it comes back in mixing. Uh, when I send the first mix, they 
they are still listening for mistakes and stuff. If I can fix it or replace parts, can you take that part and put that there? It's like that should be that should have been taken care of in the recording process. But yeah, but I mean that's maybe the rehearsal space when yeah. they were writing songs. Exactly. <laughs> but I think that's just how it's done these days. Yeah, I mean the uh, uh, you you don't only like do like band recordings you also receive already uh, recorded material and yeah. you mix and master uh, in what percentage uh, do you do, do you do them i think maybe 75 percent i do full productions and uh, 25 like mixing external work and what do you prefer For my own, like when a, when an album is released, like the rush we were talking about before, that is that's uh, the best when I have done the full production. <laughs> no. I prefer to do recording and mixing and then send mastering somewhere else for like last uh, quality control. Um, but I also enjoy mixing a lot because I'm not that emotionally invested in that because if i record something and i and i don't get happy with the mix it's it's just my fault <laughs> uh, if i receive files from someone else to mix and i'm, I'm not i'm not 100 satisfied i can just like yeah it's not my fault I, I did the best i could yeah but do you want your name on it yeah <laughs> It's yeah. It has happened that I don't want my name on stuff too. <laughs> can 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 you name drop or is it? Uh... Mm, no, not really. Um, let's let's flip the coin. Yeah. Uh, what's the like top three albums that you are the most uh, proud of? Oh, I think there's an album coming out that are not released yet with a band from Halmstad Gothenburg called Glowson. Or Gluson, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Uh, that album was a really, really great experience recording. They were super well prepared. <laughs> um, and the mixing was easy because everything was well prepared and well recorded. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Um, Another one I'm proud of is the latest Wolf Brigade album. Uh, I only did the mixing and some or like reamping and stuff like that. Um, maybe not the not the one that I'm most proud of sound wise, but I, I mean, it's Wolf Brigade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and when uh, and when you say reamping, you mean that they sent you like a DI signal? Yeah, I took the DI signals from the guitars and played it up through. Uh, a guitar amp and I also did reamping with the drums playing the drums uh, through a PA system in this room to oh. get more room oh cool uh, but that was fun they also because they were also really uh, engaged in the mixing I did like the mixing 95% finished and then they came here to sit in on the last day just doing the final touch-ups uh, which I also really enjoy when bands do that because it's much quicker. Because yeah, usually I do maybe two or three revisions to be pretty much done, but then it can be like up to five revisions with just like the tiniest, tiniest um, adjustments. Like, can you take this up half a dB? Oh no, uh, take it down half a dB again. Or can we try this? And when it, when you're at that level, it's much easier if the band just comes into the studio and we just try it. And yeah, do you like this? No, okay. Yeah. And we keep going. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I guess it has to feel like you have to like uh, end someone's sentence. Uh, I mean, you already know what they want, but you see the solution. Yeah. But uh, they think it's another thing, but you know it's another thing. It's like Sometimes, no, yeah. You mean like this? But that's or just the, a guess for me. Or the fake knob. <laughs> the knob that is not connected to anything can just turn it a little bit and do you, is this better yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you used this one uh, no not not really but i have had uh, actually a lot of times someone asked can you can you do that 
and then I'm like reaching for it, but I haven't done it yet. And they say, oh, that sounds much better. And I'm like, I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> like the placebo effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the placebo effect is underestimated. Yeah. And it can also be when I get uh, mixed revisions. If I do the mixing myself and set it off to the band and then li they listen to it, send me notes. Maybe there's sometimes things that I don't agree with or some stuff they write that I don't understand. And there have been more than a few occasions where I like have been in a hurry or something. So I just don't do those certain comments. I just I, I just leave that for now and do the, the other stuff and I send it off and see if they still care about it. And then in the next revision, they don't say anything about it. So maybe they think I changed it or I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe it was something else that yeah, they meant that uh, uh, that you uh, did uh, like uh, automatically. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. <laughs> Commercial time. Motherfucker. Well, I started a Patreon. Wheel Must is now on Patreon. It's Wheel Must on Patreon. So, it always itch on your nose when you drink beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have to edit that out. <laughs> uh, was, it a, was it a decision from the beginning? It's like, uh, did you know that? I want to be a sound technician when you started up uh, that first studio in Jönköping in your rehearsal space. Did you have like a... Um, to be 100% honest, I've been pretty pessimistic about it. So I, I started like a, as a hobbyist when I was still in, uh, in school. Started to buy stuff and then I, after I graduated, I had a pretty decent paying job. So I bought a lot of equipment. And it was my, my dream was to have a part-time job and a part-time studio. I kind of never realized that you could work full-time in a studio. <laughs> like that didn't occur to me. So I was like, hey, I want to have a, a part-time job and then I can be part-time in the studio. And I worked for that for a long, long time uh, until I realized that I really couldn't concentrate on anything. I was like, not really focused on work and I was not focused on the studio. So mm -hmm. I kind of have a, had a, a mental breakdown uh, when me and my girlfriend was on a, a car, car trip in Europe. I had a mental breakdown in the car <laughs> and she was like, okay, but you can, shouldn't you just try to do this full time? And I was like, I'm not sure if I can. But then, yeah, she had a good paying job at the time. So it was like, yeah, but try it. The worst thing that can happen is that I have to pay the rent. So I just said, yeah, okay, I give, I give it five years. And if I can get it like floating after five years, a payback. Uh, no, nah, I never, <laughs> I don't, I never had to borrow any money, <laughs> but if I get it floating after five years and like make it sustainable, I keep at it. And if I can't, I will just quit and just have it as a hobby. But now it's, that's like four and a half years ago, I think. And it's it's perfectly fine. It's, it's not like a super well-paying job, but I mean, yeah, we have a house. <laughs> yeah. So it's fine. And a, and a van. Yeah. And uh, you have enough money to buy dog food. So, yeah. I mean. And beers and yeah. ice, Thank, uh, ice thanks. cream. Thanks. Uh, I'll switch you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what uh, what is and what has been your your uh, biggest inspirations uh, like uh, when you're hungry for uh, for the, for learning uh, who uh, who do you turn to and what do you turn to when i was younger there was uh, like a online forum what do you call it well, like a forum like a a bulletin like reddit yeah uh, yeah, I was at studio.se, but I, I hang, hung out there quite a bit. And then I think I just, my learning process was kind of slow. I know some other people found other internet uh, forums that was really good for like metal and stuff like that. I, for some reason, never found those. <laughs> so <laughs> I just worked with a lot of crappy bands and uh, fell into that like, uh, like, if you charge with very little money, uh, you get clients thereafter, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, 
I feel like I have evolved more the last four years when I started working full time, when I realized I had to raise my rates to make a living. The quality of the bands that I record got much, much better quickly. And it's, it's weird. It's like you, don't, you, you, you can be afraid of raising your rates because you think you will lose work. But I mean, that didn't happen. I just got more work and better work. <laughs> Hmm. So it's weird. It's is it like different a, kinds of music, or is it just uh, like uh, bigger bands in the same uh, genres? Not necessarily bigger bands, but I think bands that take themselves more serious and want to invest in what they do. Yeah, and I, I'm really uncomfortable with like money and stuff like that. So that's also why I took so long to get into making this a living. Yeah, um, but someone. Very, very Swedish of you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but some, someone said like a, a good way to put it is that if a band doesn't want to invest in themselves, why should I? Yeah, exactly. So I think that's, yeah, it's uh, because if I record a band with like five guys that all have good paying full time jobs and they pay me like shit and nothing, it's like then I basically pay for their recording. <laughs> Yeah. And why should I do that? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you get paid more, maybe you put a little bit more heart and soul. Absolutely, and have more more dedication to yeah, yeah deliver a, the deliver the best you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird uh, like a yeah. <laughs> it's a weird magic uh, thing that you have to find a good sweet spot for. Uh, what was the original question? I don't remember what we were talking about. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's a little bit uh, like yeah. uh, that's uh, that's a little bit off the off the point. Mm -hmm. We guess, we say, yeah, <laughs> just talk. <laughs> you have had uh, one intern that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, young guy from uh, Småland, Sweden, mm. Växjö, uh, Adolf. Uh, fuck, vad hette han? Det här får du klippa bort. <laughs> fuck it. Uh, you had uh, one intern from, uh, from Småland, Sweden, Växjö. Yeah, Växjö, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you had other interns and uh, the times when you don't have anybody, uh, anybody around here? Do you ever get like lonely? What's your, what's your trick there? Mm, I, when I'm here in the studio, I mostly do recording. Um, so then I'm then I'm here with bands, and then I do a lot of mixing both here, but I also do a lot of mixing from home. Uh, since we are three guys uh, sharing the studio, so it's a bit hard to be. It's hard to work full time with both recording and mixing here for three people. So we have to like switch it up a little bit. Um, but I had I had a lot of not a lot of interns, but a couple of interns. Uh, most of them were really really good. Uh, I must come up with one here. Arnold. Adolf. Al Alfred. Men heter han? Jo, Alfred. Alfred. Heter han det? Jag visste fan det är Alfred. Det är Alfred. Arthur. Alfred. Arthur. Ja. Åh, hej Bobban. Ja, det är bäst. Ja. Det är bra. Mm. Yes. Albert. Uh, Albert was his name. <laughs> Arnold. Evert. Adolf. Sorry, Albert. Arnold. No, he was, uh, he was probably the most uh, engaged intern I've had. Uh, it was really easy to put to work. I, I really like when interns are self. Uh, what do you call it? When they don't really, so, uh, they don't always like wait for you. Self, to, self. Uh, they take initi initiatives. Yeah. Uh, he was really good at that. I had uh, a couple of other really good interns too. Uh, we had a younger guy here once, whose mother called and asked if he could intern because he loves music so much. 
and then he just sit, sat here in the sofa watching his phone for two weeks. <laughs> so after that, we don't luck, take, we don't take any interns whose mothers calls and asks for it, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> and this guy, is, he, he's uh, he's always around the studio. Yeah, he's the most he's the most intern. Yeah. He's, now he's an assistant. <laughs> Boo boo. The studio dog. When yeah. we arrived, he um, it was fluffy. Yeah, it was fluffy as hell. It, it looks like he lost like uh, half his body. Yeah. <laughs> One question that I always ask people is like, the most fucked up times that you've had, mm -hmm. and I mean, uh, even if the soundboard starts burning or uh, or a band member, uh, Bobo. Take uh, take uh, drinks too much or take uh, too much happy pills or like yeah. What's the most fucked up thing that, that ever happened here? I mean, it's a different thing on tour with your bands, of course, but I mean, like in the studio. I mean, you can't really compare it to touring. Touring is always <laughs> fucked up, <laughs> but in the studio, most people are really. I mean, s since a band usually pays money to be in the studio, they are usually a bit more. Uh, what do you call it? Tidy in their behavior. Yeah. But at one point I was in, uh, I've been in Portugal twice recording albums. Uh, Symbios was one of them, as yeah. I mentioned before. Uh, the other one was a band called uh, We Are The Damned, uh, where the singer there, he got so mad. The other members didn't want to be in the studio when he was recording vocals. <laughs> So and when, when it didn't go as he, he planned, he got so mad, so he smashed his phone into the wall. Uh, and then after that, he wanted to use my phone to call his bandmates <laughs> to come back. <laughs> it was pretty funny, but that album turned out really good, too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if you could give any advice to, to yourself, if you can, like, travel back in time. Mm. And uh, back to 2004, mm. rehearsal room recordings. What tips and tricks would you give yourself to be able to do what you have done, but better? Like things that you notice by time. Uh, focus more earlier uh, and don't be, don't think you have to have another side gig or work try to jump full time into it sooner uh, and also try to find more good bands to work with like network more and don't just work with the local bands that already know you um, that's also something that i've been a lot better at since i started working full time since i yeah you have to <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's yeah. As I said, that was uh, a big part of my really long learning curve was that I was only working with like amateur bands. Uh, so I was I was never really happy with the mixes, but it's hard to make a good mix of a band that doesn't sound great to begin with. It's harsh, but it's true. Um, is is there any band that has been a part of your history? Like they have come back a lot of times, like recording more and more albums, and they've grown to become, uh, in some yeah, in, in some sense like uh, bigger, more more uh, famous. I mean, the famous bands that I worked with are not that many, but I had uh, most of the bands I work with come back. Uh, the only ones that don't come back are usually not like a good personal fit to begin with. So it's not, it's not, it's nothing I take personal. I mean, some people you work re really good with and you, the product that comes out the other end are really great and you're all proud of it. And if that doesn't happen, they, they're probably better off working with someone else. Um, but I mean, M40 is one of those bands. That I like work with them. You're like family. Yeah, we are family. <laughs> uh, also, what are they called? Inevitable End. 
was a band that I recorded like two demos with them, and then they got signed on Relapse Record. Oh, cool. Uh, recorded two albums. That's that. a quality mark. It used to be a quality yeah, yeah, mark, yeah. like back in the like, uh, early 2000s. I mean, every band that Relapse released. When, uh, at what time did they get signed on Relapse? Could have been like... I don't remember, but early 2000s sometimes, 2000... No, no, no. Sorry, I have to ask Google. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, it's quick. Uh, 2009. 2009, yeah. was the first album, and the second one was in 2011. Oh, that's fucking uh, cool. But then also the drummer from that band started like a Americana folk uh, one-man band that I also followed, uh, recorded EPs, demos, and albums. And now he just released an album on a Swedish label called, uh, what do you call it, I Ikea, I think? Icons Creating Evil Art. <laughs> uh, and he is really, really good playing. Uh, like, yeah, plays drums with his feet, uh, guitar and uh, harmonica and sings. Oh, it's like one of those Joe Buck guys. Yeah, and even on the albums, he's like doing most of it in a live take. And it's just like some overdubs and stuff to make it sound more like a finished production. Oh, I see. Uh, it's like really, really dark lyrics. And the thematics is a lot of political and vegan stuff. <laughs> All right. So it's pretty cool. Fits you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. We have this thing in Sweden that we call uh, Musikhjälpen. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know where uh, it's like the music help. They uh, they uh, gather a lot of money and they, like uh, meet this political guy and pay yeah. this price and they auction it out. It's a state financed radio. Is it right? Yeah, probably. Sw uh, Swedish radio is doing this annually. Yeah, and they give the money to yeah. like uh, building uh, villages and... Uh, uh, in distant countries and uh, uh, yeah mm. like uh, uh, kids with cancer yeah i really i really don't know <laughs> this, this is really really bad i don't i don't even know where the money is sent this year do you know uh no i forgot we talked about it the other day but you were on this music help yes, and you auctioned we collect, out we collected money for them yeah and, uh, it was one weekend at the studio right yeah two days Two days. Uh, what 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 the band won and what uh, did they pay for it? To be honest, I don't know. It's uh, Peter, the owner of the studio, is yeah. the one that uh, had the, like the connection to them. But it's I don't think it's a fame. It was uh, a woman that won the, the auction, and uh, we said that we're gonna have more communication after the, like the Christmas holidays and stuff. So oh. I'm not really sure yet. Yeah. And what did it end up? Uh, Costing her? Uh, 11,500 Swedish crowns. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it's decent. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's like the usual price, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I was afraid that it's going to like end up like 500 crowns or something to me. So it's still <laughs> really awkward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some band. It's like, yeah, yeah perfect. This uh, this actually fit us. Yeah. <laughs> we get to work uh, with the uh, Ulf at Hoborek for, yeah. for 600 crowns. <laughs> Fyra spänn. Fyra spänn. Oh shit. Uh, this uh, this Corona period uh, yeah. that we've been in. Uh, have you seen a decline of bands wanna that wanna record or uh, what does that look like? It's it's hard to say. The now the the second wave of the the virus has been a bit harsher. Uh, the first one I didn't notice much at all. The only thing I noticed then was uh, a client I had from America that was coming over in April or May, but he had to cancel. Um, but other than that, it's been fine the whole the, the whole year. So I thought, yeah, maybe I'm 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 immune. <laughs> My business is immune to this. Mm -hmm. But then now the second wave came, and it's been it's a bit yeah, it's been a bit rough. I haven't I still have the same amount of bookings. And there are no like cancellations. Bands just have to postpone their recordings. No. Um, and the sad part is that it's mostly because the rehearsal spaces are closed. 
So yeah. Yeah, bands couldn't rehearse, so then they can't come and record. Uh, which is a bit, yeah. I mean, you can say what you want about it, but. Uh, yeah, but it's definitely been a decline at this uh, second. Yeah, week. I think so. At first, I thought not, but I can see now because it's, since it's the end of the year, I'm starting to do my bookkeepings, uh, and I I see kind of <laughs> where it where the second wave starts. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's yeah, I think it's going to be fine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's going to blow over like everything else. Yeah. So we have a <laughs> vaccine. I uh, I say it every time when I when I do this podcast that uh, we shouldn't talk about the boring stuff like uh, like politics and yeah. Corona and uh, <laughs> yeah let's let's put a that can be so much fun though <laughs> yeah <laughs> about this guy uh, Bobo we're gonna we're gonna go to the, the places of the studio that only the dog sees we're gonna <laughs> do some B shots yeah. Uh, the world through Bubo's eyes. Uh, all right. Um, I could talk to you for hours, but yeah. uh, it's another uh, day. Yeah. And uh, so soon it's summer and we can uh, play some baseball and uh, beer football on your uh-huh. huge lawn at yes. your new house. I'm looking forward to that. I have, I have a, what do you call it? Uh, one of those tractor lawnmowers. Ah, and also, uh, what are called? Luftiva. Luftiva. Air, uh, air gun. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, you can come and drive the tractor and shoot some guns. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Always dreamt of it. Yeah. <laughs> and drink beers. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, uh, thanks uh, so much. Thank you so much for uh, letting me come here for free. <laughs> <laughs> It's always a pleasure, yeah. and, it, and it feels so <laughs> official when, when we do it like this with cameras. Uh, uh, we uh, we we usually meet each other at uh, at parties and uh, play mm. games and eat dinners and whatever. It's always weird to- speaking English. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> but uh, for uh, for the people at home, uh, thanks for watching and uh, insert jingle here. <laughs>